Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Mastering Dungeons. I'm Sean Merwin here with my Millennial Falcon co-host, Teo Sabadia. Nice shirt. When I YT, I YT 1300. <laughs> I, I will take your word for it. Uh, I, I'm old. I don't know what anything means anymore. Uh, I could only read my shirt on the screen. Name. Otherwise, I wouldn't remember it. I'm not that kind of geek. Okay, you're the best kind of geek. Uh, speaking of geeks, I just realized that our show notes are 16 pages long, hmm. and you know our our patrons get to access that. And I know DMs Guild products that are uh, shorter <laughs> and yet still like sell really well. So I, I don't know if that's good or if that's bad, but it is what we it is what we have. We are thorough. Yep. And I wanted to give a special shout out to Mr. Donovan and the Fredonia High School Game Club, which hosted me uh, last week. I ran the first mini mission of Treasure of the Broken Horde for a select group of players, and it was really fun to get a chance to sit down with them and, and play. So. That is uh, a thank favorite you for of mine. the slice of pizza and for hosting him. Yeah. Pizza blood drinker uh, was 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 back and better than ever. <laughs> it's a great. If anyone out there listening has not played Minions of the Broken Horde, like just that first one or Treasures of the Broken Horde, that first one is so good, so good. Just mm. great. Yeah. Good times, good times. But we have a lot to talk about this week. Not only do we have news coming from every which way and we have the dmg chapter three to talk about we also have several missives from our listener corner so i want to thank everybody uh who has been chatting with us on discord on youtube on twitter mastodon at real life conventions wherever even our fevered imaginations you uh your input and questions and comments are appreciated. And with that, we will start with Hyperlexic, who contacts us via Twitter. I sort of, I'm, I'm distilling this down to just a few uh, lines, but I want to thank Hyperlexic for the longer version as well. Uh, Hyperlexic says, on the system complexity versus accessibility topic, I wonder how much of this is Wizards of the Coast, assuming that the execution will be heavily automated through D&D Beyond and the Wizards VTT. Robin Laws has been saying for a while that, quote, theoretically heavy automation could shift the complexity versus flow balance, and maybe Wizards believes the same thing. This is a really great point. Uh, mm -hmm. It's something I've heard other people discussing as well. And it's not a terribly revolutionary thought, right? It's been around in theoretical circles for years that automation can be used to hide complexity, <clears throat> not just in gaming, but in all fields, education, right? All, all, all different sorts of, uh, all different sorts of fields. So you just want to be sure if you follow this thread that the automation while hiding the complexity doesn't also hide the fun also doesn't hide the other positives of what you are trying to do. So if wizards of the coast is thinking this great. So as we cover the, the UAs and the play test packets and so on, and we talk about complexity, maybe they're assuming this. And if they are, I hope they consider what are two of the main positives that have been brought up about D&D &D recently. And it's something that we players who have been around for a while already know, which is having the game be at least a little complex helps the players and the game masters with their comprehension and math skills. Mm -hmm. Being able to read and parse rules is can be an important skill and being able to do math is, is often fairly important, but also the socialization, also the back and forth and the, the talking in terms of the narrative that the story creates, but also the discussion around the rules and around those sorts of things. And lots of people, psychiatrists, psychologists, parents talk about this importance of D and D and role-playing games in teaching socialization to, to folks. So if you do, use uh automation to hide complexity i hope that automation also doesn't hide those things 
Uh, that's really well said. I can't say much more to that, but it, it did, you know, when I read this question, it, it was actually th- something I hadn't thought about. Like I'd thought about the idea of like, oh, they're going to write fifth edition 2024 for the VTT, which I have not seen that really be the case. But the idea that, hey, we can make the game a bit more complex because everybody's using D&D Beyond, I hadn't actually contemplated that. But I think that there's some polling that suggests that something like, I don't know, 60%, this is a rough number, don't take me on this, uh, use D&D Beyond. And that's in like online polling, which is going to favor that kind of outcome. You know, if anything, push it upwards because you're not just going to random homes and gaming stores and things like that and asking people you're right. asking online. Um, and, you know, 40% not is a huge amount. And you, you can't, you should not ignore that percentage mm-hmm. That is not using D and D Beyond, and I think it would be sort of folly to make the game, if I dare say so, for that sixty percent or whatever the percentage is, um, even if it's mm-hmm. seventy, right, or eighty. Like, like that's those are significant numbers, and you want growth of game, not shrinkage of game. Um, so, I, I would not right. want to see this happen for all the reasons. I wouldn't. I don't think it's good for wizards. I don't think it's good for the reasons you stated. Um, I could see that thinking, but but I hope that's not behind what is taking place. Yeah. I think what D&D Beyond does more than automate the game, although it does do that in some ways, is automate character creation. Yeah. Is automate that by pulling choices from varied sources and distilling them down into a pick list. Yeah. Uh, which is convenient, but it also in a lot of ways removes that sort of narrative storytelling world building element. So yeah. rather than sitting down with a book and saying, I can choose from these five subclasses and I'll read the, the explanation of what they are having them in a simple pick list. Players might go skip that story driven mm-hmm. section and just go right to the numbers, which then can be useful, but it also takes a little bit away from the game uh doing that yeah all right so thank you uh hyperlexic we also have via mastodon a question from george pr which goes along similar lines but asks a different question uh george pr says i love your discussion and analysis on weapon mastery i love the idea of weapon mastery and i always thought the fighter was rather banal though i never really considered that if that a feature as opposed to Mm -hmm. a bug I wonder, too, though, how much of the increased complication is being obscured by tools like D&D Beyond. So that harkens Mm -hmm. back to the question that we just asked. But the question that George PR asks is, as a designer, do you have a user persona for player types? And you and I have spoken, Teo, significantly on player types, but we tend to focus on player types at the table. Mm Mm-hmm. This sort of question to me goes beyond that, and it's almost it's almost a marketing and sales player type. Mm-hmm. Uh, what what do you prefer to play rather than when you choose this? How do you play it? Uh, so I see this as a question of are there are there levels of choice for players based on not their player type but their purchasing type their their game i don't even uh, because this persona is something that's used in marketing yeah uh, where you group people by demographics or actions or any other information that you can gather and then you put them into groups and you direct information to those groups in different ways whether it's making the message longer or shorter whether it's making it more complicated or more uh, or easier to read whether it's more colorful or more text-based, you know, all of those things can go into that. And so I hope that Wizards of the Coast is thinking about that in terms of those things, because that's something a sales and marketing team should be doing. I hope that the designers, though, while keeping that in mind, don't change the game too much based on those things, except to understand that they are actually there are people out there in these persona types. Yeah. And I think that this all was a, 
it was user led, right? It was it was gamer led in that uh, designers realized, hey, you know what? The person who wants to play a more simple game, they're they're always playing the fighter, and boy, is the fighter the most popular mm-hmm. class there is. So we need to preserve a simple mm-hmm. choice. In fact, enshrine it because there's this huge number of people mm-hmm. who always pick the fighter and and want that as the simple case. And then you have people who love you know, class X or Y varies across edition sometimes because they want a little more complexity in the game, a little more tactics. And there's medium complexity, like the rogue tends to be. Um, there is sort of strategic complexity, like the monk tends to be, right? Moving around, positioning, doing things that maybe aren't like numerically huge, but are sort of about the movement and the jumping and things like that. Um, and and so understanding that, and and you tend to see that like the warlock tends to be a sort of lots of choices and lots of, you know, how do you express yourself type type things? And so it's smart to build that because you're building to what players want, although it tends to be players who know the game. But but you're doing that in a very um, concerted design fashion so that and, and you're making sure. And, and they did this for fifth edition, right? The, the designers talked about this like in fifth edition. They would look at what is our spread of classes and what is our spread of complexity so we can make sure that 2014 mm-hmm. has appeal to different groups. and. I'm sure you've seen this at convention tables running a lot where you have pre-gens and it doesn't matter what the game is. It doesn't have to be D and D. There are people who will immediately pick that fighter type. Oh, this guy just shoots and Mm -hmm. does thing with a laser rifle. That's me. This thing is a swarm Mm -hmm. of ball bearings. Like I'm always picking that one, right? (laughs) That's the one I pick. And, and I, you know, has a, it's a half octopus thing that has an ink thing. I want to play with that. Show me, you know, give that to me. And then there are folks who will, yep. you know, always or never touch the spellcaster, right? And so that's uh, that's mm-hmm. something to design for. I think that's very helpful. How you communicate that to the PR level, right. I'm not sure, but um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in order to do that, what you have to do is start with the base classes as simple, mm-hmm. because somebody might want to play a spellcaster, but they want it to be simple. Some. Mm-hmm. Sorcerer, some people right? might want to play you know the right so you that's why you have a sorcerer and and then if you need to add complexity from there make it the subclass be the complex piece mm-hmm. instead of making the class be the complex piece and yeah. with 12 plus one classes you you have that flexibility but then you have to let everyone know that you want to play a spellcaster but simple then here's your sorcerer you have the same five spells that you cast over and over and over again. Yeah. And, and that's cool. And, and, and you know, the player you, types, it, but as you say, if you look at the sorcerer, seeing the table that has fewer spells on it, which is one of the first things you see as you start flipping through that communicates right there, right? Ah, oh, fewer choices, mm. simpler. I like this. And so it's interesting to see 2024 tinkering with that and changing that in a way that could confuse the person who's trying to look for those cues to say, which of these is my simple, which of these is my complex. And then now you're not sure Ooh, I get mad magic earlier. That sounds kind of complicated. Do I want that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, that's a great question and simple answer. I hope they keep it in mind without letting it totally derail any uh, game design questions that might come up. Yeah, and, and weapon we mastery. Have which question is, here. This one. I just want to say the weapon mastery, which is part of that question, right? Goes back to that whole concept of: right. Are you getting to where, you know, all of these classes suddenly have an extra piece of tactics, of complexity, of optimization, of decision review that makes it more complicated? Mm-hmm. So if you have that pregen on the table, and now you know it used to be, if you think of the the starter set, it came with two fighters, right? And one was like great weapon mm-hmm. and one's shield and 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 long sword or something like that and it, but it's still really simple yeah. right and now it's like wait, what are my weapon masteries and there's just that extra little bit that makes right. it harder to achieve that for sure uh next we have chad lynch via patreon who s- says i just listened to the chapter one episode and i'm pra- uh, particularly interested in the weapon specialization topic it got me thinking about weapons, especially magic weapons. Perhaps templates would work well for magic weapons that could be applied to any weapon and not limit who can use it. So no more Vorpal swords. Now it's a Vorpal template. Uh, I also think levels of proficiency should be applied to weapons. Just because you are good with a longsword doesn't mean you are good with a dagger. 
then weapon choices become more than what number is the biggest. Mm-hmm. I'd love to hear any thoughts you all have. Tao, so I'm going to let you take the first half of that question there. Yeah, so weapon uh, kind of templates is something I've thought a lot about. Um, in in fourth edition, this was something that I really felt resonating with me, this topic, because when Dark Sun came out, Dark Sun has all of these custom uh, weapon types that are from the setting, the Caracal, the El Hulak, you know, just on and on. And so we wanted to put those in the organized play adventures for the Ashes of Athos program so that it really felt like Dark Sun. But one of the things you saw is the magic items would say, you know, longsword. It would be battle axe. It would be, you know, and you're like, oh, you know, that's interesting to see that all of these magic weapons tend to be longsword and greatsword and things like that. And so what we did was just change up the concept so that we weren't awarding people magic weapons per se. We were awarding them something that you would apply to a weapon you had. Um, So it might be like a, a hilt wrapping that you'd put around whatever the hilt of your weapon was. Or it might be something that was like a gem that you'd wrap around it. Uh, or it could be training, like someone would teach you a special technique. And all of that would allow you to, to just use whatever weapon you felt like using. And that worked really well. Like players really enjoyed that. It also kept it from being the, um, the golf bag effect, right? You, you'd just choose whatever you were most enjoyed and you'd put that benefit onto it. It also kept power from creeping in because you could only have sort of one thing added to your weapon generally. Mm-hmm. Um, so it had a lot of advantages yeah. to it that, that I really liked with this idea of a template. And, and it is a concept I prefer over just stating that a weapon must be a certain type. What do you think, Sean? Uh, I, I agree. I agree totally. And I want to uh, address the second part of the question, which is talking about levels of proficiency. Mm-hmm. I think there's two ways you could do this. One way is is the way that Chad describes, which is, you become proficient in not all martial weapons, but a choice of weapon or weapons. And then you get the differentiation there. The other uh, level of proficiency is, you know, as you, as you increase, you gain more abilities with a weapon as you gain more proficiency with it. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that second uh, type of proficiency in all levels of D&D, all editions, right? Even going back to AD&D, they, they had uh, double specialization. They had they had proficiency, specialization, and double specialization. So if you were specialized in a weapon, you used a proficiency slot on the same weapon twice. So one slot proficient, two slots uh, specialized, three slots double specialized. So if you were specialized, it was plus one to hit, plus two to damage. And if you were double specialized, it was plus three to hit, plus three to damage. And so it's been in the game before. Uh, yeah. By doing that, of course, you you aren't able, excuse me, to gain proficiency in other weapons. But do you need to be proficient in other weapons if you have your great sword? And your longbow, and that's all you need. You just put all your proficiency slots to specialize and double specialize in those. Uh, and all, all what all of this does is it just adds another level of complexity, which for some people is wonderful. And if it's if it's designed very tightly and very carefully, it can be an interesting and fun choice. But what happens when you add complexity? As soon as people start playing, they're going to figure out mathematically which is the best option, <laughs> and everyone is going to start doing that. Yeah. And the the more complex it is, the more chance there is that that compl- that uh, differentiation and power level becomes clear, or the larger the gap is between the best and the least optimized things. And that's just the it's just the nature of design that that's going to happen. So. Again, I I don't hate the idea. We've seen it before. Mm-hmm. I just want that balance between the simplicity of the game for new players or for the people who want simplicity versus this complexity that you'll introduce if you introduce these new systems. It's really interesting how much of this we've seen before. Like Mike Olson, who we had on the show talking about fate, uh, was bringing up on our Discord that... Um, you know, weapon mastery, the actual term appears in the uh, rules compendium as an option and, and is not that dissimilar from what's being talked about here. 
Uh, the idea of templates, right? You can yeah. talk about third edition and how you'd, you'd choose to put, you know, flaming burst and, you know, any of these other features as a sort of improvement that you'd build into a, a magic item. And, and, and so we, it's interesting to look back, back at those designs. You can never 100% copy it because the game is different and the way people play is different. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing that if I step back with, from this question and think, you know, where are we? I think to myself that the biggest surprise with 1D&D &D 2024 is that it is addressing these sort of and drawing out these kind of crunchy questions rather than the role playing questions. And if you'd asked almost anybody, you know, two years ago in this era of streaming and live plays, you know, what are we going to see supported the most? It would probably be that sort of like playing creatively, playing imaginatively, making for a great stream. And none of these things are that, right? Which is so fascinating to me. Like nobody right. needs an extra feat for that streaming game or the proficiency bonus to be doubled or any, you'd, you'd need different types of things that other mm -hmm. RPGs do actually quite well and you could borrow from and that we know how to do instead of this. And so I mm -hmm. tend to think that's my answer to this is like, these are all fine. And I, as a player can really get into this type of stuff, but I don't think it's where we want, mm -hmm. where D and D should want to go based on what the larger audience is doing. Yeah. Unless it is a business push to have more crunch, to have more complexity because we can sell more content by adding this complexity. And that's not, that's not a knock on the game. That's no, but, just a, a reality that we have to live in. Yeah. But, but I guess the question is, are we, why are we, why is wizards still worried about selling 10 more books when that doesn't add up to their goals? And, and 10 can be a million more books. It doesn't matter. Like why focus on right. selling a million right. more books when you should want to have branded beach towels and, and um, birthday party plates again. Right. And, and we're seeing right. some of that, but, well, but that's, that's the big money, right? Is you want pop tarts, branded pop tarts. That's and very true. Hot pockets. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. But the design team can't do that. The design team can only do what the design team can do. Yeah. And if if it's said, all right, it, this is a full team effort. So we, the marketing and branding team, are going to work our tails off to get Hot Pockets and Salami and Bologna uh, branded with D&D. &D. You, the design team, need to make a game that captures everyone's imagination and gets all the people of all types of players to buy this game and get invested in this game so that when they see the hot pockets in the grocery stores freezer section, they are going to want to buy that. Yeah. And so, you know, that sort of let's all get together and build toward this work toward this one goal. It, it, yeah. It, yeah. It's something that they may feel the need to do, especially if there is a, uh, you know, a, an accountant somewhere up the chain saying, if we could sell a hundred thousand more of each book that we sell, that translates into 10,000 more customers for our beach towel, uh, and, and, uh, hot pockets. Yeah. And I guess the this question show, by is... the way, is not sponsored by hot pockets, <laughs> yeah. although we would take hot pocket money if we could get it. But some have accused us of a bunch of baloney. So, you know, it's true. That's true. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess the question is, you know, yeah. is doubling your specialization, giving you another feed, is that increasing the number of players? I don't know. It, it might, it might not, but what, what's happening is other games are coming out with more complexity that are basically D and D knockoffs. Um, so players that want that complexity are saying, Ooh, if I play this game, I get a third type of action that I can do things with. I'm going to go play that because that is better. Um, yeah. and so that's another thing that they have to hedge their bets against as well. I mean, I think it'll be interesting to see whether the, the, say like the Valiant RPG Kickstarter, how that does compared to shadow dark, for example. Uh, which is so rules light and, and has not only captured the imagination, but people are playing it. 
right? Which is a testament to right. both its design That's and the deal. appeal yeah. of that type of game. So, you know, if mm -hmm. if the crunchier ones don't actually seem to be resonating like the lighter ones, that would be pretty interesting. Um, but at the end of the day, D&D &D doesn't operate like any other role playing game. It gets to chart its course because it is the biggest player. And, and to me, the things that make it bigger are, are things like Stranger Things. Right? It's 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 almost beyond the game. The game helps for sure, but it's beyond the game how you get that growth. Mm -hmm. And then you what you want is people to interact with your game and have it be easy, even if you're almost like the improbable demographic for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Interesting things. Interesting times. Uh, so let's, uh, we'll, we have more questions lined up for next week. So if you have a question uh, at the end of the show, we will tell you all the ways that you can get us your questions. But let's get into our news and commentary section. We are not going to cover any more of the Unearthed Arcana this, this week. We've got more than enough content to cover so maybe next week we will dig into one of the other classes that are there but you can already give your feedback on that because the new ua survey is up and, and, and I, it uh I survey this, okay. i thought it focused on weapon mastery so i wrote that in our show notes but i i think it actually is the whole survey and you can choose which parts to mm -hmm. answer um oh. right we were joking that with a with an unearthed arcana of that size, it might take you forty eight hours to fill out the survey for it. But apparently, as a, I haven't taken it, but apparently other people have, and said you can choose which section specifically to talk about. And there are also two new videos up uh, talking about the previous survey for the paladin and the druid, and then talking about the recent packet focusing on the warlock uh, weapon mastery and epic feats. What are your thoughts, Teos, on these videos? Oh, there's some really, really fascinating stuff in these videos. Um, the Paladin apparently scored super high, everything above 70%. Um, there were some questions about staying true to the nature of Paladins, like, you know, range smite. Is that really what they should have uh, that they're considering? But otherwise, the Paladin went really well. And then they said, the Druid went like we expected. I'm like, really? You wanted to <laughs> create a contentious packet? I don't know that you did. But um, but they did say it was very contentious. Uh, slightly more than half did not like the idea of a single common stat block for wild shape, but the others did. And so they think they can tweak, tweak that approach to speak to the naysayers. Uh, and they said for sure their goal is to not ask a player to consider 100 stat blocks and decide which one to turn into, which I appreciate. Um, not everybody does. I know that, <laughs> but, um, but that's what they're going to focus on. And what they did say is we'll see another UA again for the Druid with an, ent they said entirely new take. I'm not sure that that's really the wording he meant to say. Um, but you know, I wonder if it's gonna be like customizable stat blocks as they've hinted at before when the, when the yeah. results kind of, when the impressions first started to be heard. Um, any thoughts on that? No, I think I don't think that is surprising information at all mm -hmm. based on you know, what we talked about and what I've heard other people talk about in terms of those two things. Well, allow me to surprise you now because video two on the recent packet had some quotes that I, I was surprised by. Uh, Jeremy talked about epic feats and he said that they felt players did not remember that they existed. So these level 20 feats now being now having an epic feat assigned to your character becomes a preview to help groups remember that these exist and that you can get more. To which I thought, who cares about what happens at 20th level? Don't, isn't your own data telling you that basically nobody's playing at level 20? Like, sure. why do you need to preview a thing at the end of the game? Why was this a concern? Yeah. Wait, <laughs> and was he talking about forgetting that epic feats existed or forgetting yeah. that feats themselves uh, existed? No, that, that, that epic feats existed. And so that now okay. you get this preview... Okay. And you'll maybe want to award more. I, I'm like I don't, and I don't think people love them. So I don't. I guess I don't. Under, I thought this was all very fascinating. Um, yeah, that's that's weird. Yeah, and then the other part is he says that this is similar to why they wanted to add a feat to backgrounds at level one, and he says that fewer than half of all groups use feats. 
Okay. So I'm taking that in. Okay. I'm with you. Okay. He says the survey suggests that some are feet curious. So now by imposing feet on everyone, you get to try feet and decide whether to use them or to use the ability scores. I'm mm -hmm. like, wait, fewer than half use them, so they don't like them. I don't think they're ignoring. I don't think they're missing that chapter in the book. So you're going to make them yeah. use it. And you've also made feats so much better in this edition in 2024 than you did in 2014 by usually giving you an extra plus one to an ability score beyond what they already did and tell DMs, hey, you can mm -hmm. still give your players just the plus two ability scores. I don't think that's going to go well. The DM's going to look like a villain if they try to not allow feats now. I thought that was really uh, interesting. Yeah. I did not follow the thinking, you know, other than at a very <laughs> English parsing level. Yeah, that that's a whole it's a whole lot to unpack. I did not watch the video and yeah. I I was very happy to have feats be optional i was mm -hmm. gonna say optimal which is a floridian slip um on my part uh yeah i was happy to have them be optional and but even you know making something that was in the previous edition or the previous two editions sort of mandatory to then go and make them optional in the next edition as as you say teos sort of makes them not as optional as you might think Mm -hmm. because players are going to assume players assume that flanking gives you advantage people assume that they're just going to be able to use feats and by making them optional the it's it makes the dm seem like a bad person if they say please let's not use flanking or let's not use uh feats yeah and dms are parents right it's DMs just Mm -hmm. we're, we're as a dm you are given the tough role of having to say no to things that players want but should not want right like just the way that kids want candy or to stay up super late and they don't understand the repercussions <laughs> and that's what the dm often has to do for the good of the campaign but. right right hmm. yeah and and you know sometimes it's not sometimes it's a dm wanting to win Mm -hmm. But a lot of times it is the DM saying, I can see where this is going if we continue down this path. It will be less fun for you in the long run, and it will be less fun for me in the long run. So let's cut this off now. And often players, you, you said it before, right? Players saying, I hate the way this plays, but I have to play it, <laughs> right? I hate yeah. that I have to take this feat, but I have to. I mean, my, my ranger, no, my 20th level don't. ranger has sharpshooter, right? I mean, why? Because it's right. so dumb not to take it. it it's so, you know, and, and I feel mm -hmm. compelled to. And there's a part of me that wants to say, like, you know, I took, I, I chose the feat that gives me three skills, but no, I did not. I took sharpshooter, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And um, speaking I of sharpshooter, I understand loving. Uh, I understand players loving customization, right? I I understand wanting to be able to choose different options and having choices. But again, that adds complexity. And when you add complexity to the machine, it causes problems with the machine um, and disparities mm -hmm. between the different outputs of that machine. Um, and we just yeah. we have to be wary of that. And I just find it super fascinating that, you know, that acknowledgement of, and he said it wasn't a huge margin, but, you know, more than half of, of groups are not using feats. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's wild. Um, and that this came in into play in the next piece, which is he, he said that some, there's some interesting discussion regarding great weapon master and sharpshooter going on internally. And I guess they had solid responses back on how they had toned them down. But uh, I guess some people feel strongly about them, right? Because this is their source of joy to, to deal massive amounts of damage. And Jeremy reiterated, hey, we want players to keep in mind a majority of players aren't using feats and they have perfect fun without these feats, right? So the game does not need these things to survive. Um, and, and so please you know, do understand that for groups using feats, or they understand that for groups using feats, these things can seem connected, right? Like the fun comes from these pieces. 
And I understand that because one of the reasons my ranger is super competitive at the table is because of sharpshooter. And the way my class deals attacks to many targets, sharpshooter then ups that damage, and now I'm a contender at the table. And so if that goes away, I am not a contender at the table, and my damage will be very lackluster. That doesn't mean the game's not fun to play, but I acknowledge that, right? So I think they are looking at that, uh, and they're apparently going to look at, at how that, um, how to tweak these maybe a little bit further beyond what we saw in the UA. He also said that weapon mastery and the idea of it slowing down the game is something that they have worked for months internally. And so the result is the result of trying to fine tune that, which maybe suggests it was even more complicated before. Um, and the last thing that I thought was interesting, just he talks about the warlock and how the spell slots felt like a constraint to players, which to me is sort of in that kid category where I go like, yes, it's a constraint. I don't know what the solution is more spell slots. Like I have played a warlock and thought, in fact, my problem was not that I had few spell slots, but that I had a lot of spell options. And that felt like an information mismatch. I should not have 20 options mm -hmm. for two slots. Like, just give me... Mm -hmm features that I can do twice and I'd be just as happy, right? Like, in fact, happier because that yeah. dichotomy of menu versus slots would go away. Having more slots makes the warlock, I think, more complex and changes its focus. And I don't know that that's where it should be, but we'll see. Yeah. And a, a lot of this goes back to the old adventuring day resource management type of thing. Would the game be better if there were no spell slots? Would the game be better if everyone just was able to do and encounter the things they could do? Mm -hmm. uh, how often at above fifth level do you run out of spell slots? I've asked this several times, and I always get four or five people saying, oh, I, I run out of spell slots all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you are the exception and not the rule. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, and, uh, and it it's, wasn't it's that rare way that people in other know. editions. So it is it is a complex uh, issue. I'm glad Jeremy got out in front and and gave us all these things. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, the new pal or the new wild shape for the druid or any changes to weapon mastery going forward to see what the feedback ends up being and how the game might uh, t be tweaked in order to accomplish what the designers wanted to accomplish. Yeah. Speaking of producing games, D&D is hiring a producer. What does a producer do? A producer is an ideal candidate who can uh, have proven game industry expertise in production workflow, tracking tools and resource management, strong communication and time leadership skills, a passion for product development, design and development workflows, and an affinity for games and lifestyle brands. Boy, do we have that? There are affinity. several producers art. Yes, our, our, the, there are producers already on the team. A bunch of highly skilled folks who I have worked with in the past who do a great job in essentially herding all the cats from freelancers to interfacing with the art team, with production staff, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the good news is they gave a salary range, which goes from $91,000 to $153,000. And of course, that's Seattle money. So that's a buck 20 uh, <laughs> if, you know, when you compare to, to the rural areas of New York. Uh, or yeah, that'll, that'll buy the, a cardboard the box the on the side of the street, but it's a beautiful cardboard box. True story. No, that I mean it's great that they're giving that yeah. now that information. No, that is that is a good salary. Um, so we even have a in link Seattle in our show notes. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very nice. So if you have this experience and a passion for D and D, um, there's a link in our show notes, or you can just go to uh, boards.greenhouse.io and search for Wizards of the Coast. There was some sad news in the gaming world when uh, we learned that artist Russell Nicholson has passed. You may know his work from the Fiend Folio of the AD&D days, uh, particularly the black and white style that we see a lot of detail with shadow interplay. 
um, including some of his most iconic art of the Gith Yankee and the Growl, which mm. are super memorable for those of us who grew up playing D&D in that era. God, that growl with just that beat coming down on the adventure, trying to fight mm-hmm. it. Oh, it's beautiful. And I love just looking. It's one. Yeah. He, he created these works that you could just get lost in just watching these. And he, he was really well known in the British scene and, and very influential. Uh, did a lot of work outside of D&D as well. And, and any of his works you look at and you can just get lost in the way he would do a column or the mm-hmm. shadows in the ceiling of a temple or something. Like, just great stuff. Yeah, a lot of the like old school Renaissance products that we see try to copy that black and white style um, mm-hmm. that became so iconic. We heard from DM David with another blog post called The Neglected Secret to Making Dungeons Fun to Explore. Um, you you want to give us sure. a little rundown on what this is? It's another fantastic DM David blog, um, and it's focused on how an interesting story isn't enough to make a dungeon fun and flavor is good, but that alone doesn't capture and engage players. So you need these sort of interactive features. That's the neglected secret. Mm -hmm. And these even small, simple interactions can be very effective and don't require a lot of work from the DM. So he gives examples of those. Link in our show notes or go to dmdavid.com. Excellent article on this subject. I suspect he'll follow it up with more. For sure. Uh, Jeff Stevens Games has a new product out called The Puzzling Temple of Flummox Heist. Um, Jeff Stevens and Allison Colentine uh, have created this adventure that include nine escape room style puzzles. Um, You can challenge your players and their characters with a brain teasing mix of puzzles, combat and role play in this one shot adventure for characters of third through sixth level, which will delight fans of escape rooms and solve at home mystery adventures. There's an, a, a hints appendix and solution appendix to make things easier if you tend to get frustrated like I do. Uh, and then, of course, you can just play this as a one-shot adventure or use the puzzles in your own adventure. And there are also a couple of fun combat encounters there. Uh, you got a chance to look at it, Teos. What, do you, oh, what yeah. did you think? Uh, there's some great art. The cover is amazing. Uh, the map of the complex is really cool. And I liked the puzzles. They were really clever, and, and they come in early. It's 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 creatively done how it's woven throughout the adventure. It's not just like room A, room B. It's it's even approaching the place, uh, and and I think the first sort of handout you get is is a puzzle. Um, they're really neat, uh, and and I would absolutely use the puzzles that I see here in other situations. So this is almost doubling as an adventure you can run for a, a group that likes this, or to break away from the mold of just combat, or Things you can just rip out of there and put in anywhere. They're very applicable for other situations. And designers, creators take note. Uh, Jeff highly recommends Allison for puzzle design projects. So worth considering. It's already yeah. a silver bestseller. It is already a silver bestseller. Mm-hmm. Already a silver bestseller. And it's uh, $4.95 on the Guild. A couple of crowdfunding notes here. We have Pesto's Guide to Playtesting that's out. We talked about this previously. Uh, Spencer Hibnick put out a guide to playtesting RPG products. And so now you can get it. It's available on itch uh, at pestopublications.itch.io. There's a link in the show notes. You can follow uh, Pesto Enthusiasts on Twitter. And, you know, it's a suggested $5 purchase, but you can do a name your own price. So pay what you want. Um, I would suggest checking it out. And I'm going to let Teos tell you about the next one. Yeah. Uh, Eldritch RPG second edition. Supporter of the show Dan Cross shares his Kickstarter for the second edition of the Eldritch RPG. This is an immersive narrative RPG with swift combat and a distinctive semantic design, as he calls it where the way you describe actions influences the gameplay. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, he has, mm-hmm. uh, this is the second edition of this game. So he debuts a new engine for the rules uh, with iconic items, magic foci, spirit points, and mastery dice for enhanced customization and powerful tools so you can excel in combat and other demanding scenarios. So your, your support helps bring the game uh, and its fantasy setting to life. 
And if you want to check it out, it's very easy to do. You can go to the Kickstarter page for the Eldritch RPG 2nd Edition and download the Free Player's Handbook. Uh, he also has a web flip book, so you can just kind of flip through it. You don't have to download anything and just see different pages. And a really cool video that uh, promotes it as well. So check it out. I know you'd appreciate the help. And that is our look at the news.